Hey everybody! This week is sort of the end to my little series of travel thoughts where I'm sharing some excerpts from some books that I read. Today I'm going to be talking about the traveler's mindset again, but this time focusing on traveling solo. be sharing a bit of a segue of what I was talking about last week. I'm going to talk about the benefits of traveling solo in order to have a proper mindset for traveling. So if you've watched my last few videos, you'll know that I was sharing some information from The Art of Travel by Alain de Botin, and then I was also sharing some excerpts from Full Tilt by Dervla Murphy. So I'm going to start again with a passage from The Art of Travel to start my little discussion here. And here uh, the author is talking about how after reaching the beautiful islands in Barbados, he found himself in a really foul mood after an argument, regardless of everything around him that was so beautiful. So let me share this with you first of all. Our capacity to draw happiness from aesthetic objects or material goods in fact seems critically dependent on our first satisfying a more important range of emotional or psychological needs, among them the need for understanding, for love, for expression, and respect. Thus, we will not enjoy we are not able to enjoy sumptuous tropical gardens and attractive wooden beach huts when a relationship to which we are committed abruptly reveals itself to be suffused with incomprehension and resentment. If we are surprised by the power of one sulk to destroy the beneficial effects of an entire hotel, it is because we misunderstand what holds up our moods? We are sad at home and blame the weather and the ugliness of buildings, but on the tropical island we learn after an argument in a raffia bungalow under an Esser sky, that the state of the skies and the appearance of our dwellings can never on their own either underwrite our joy or condemn us to misery. There is a contrast between the vast projects we set in motion, the construction of hotels and the dredging of bays, and the basic psychological knots that undermine them. How quickly may the advantages of civilization be wiped out by a tantrum? Intractability of the mental knots points to the austere wide wisdom of those ancient philosophers who walked away from prosperity and sophistication and argued from within a barrel or a mud hut that the key ingredients of happiness could not be material or aesthetic, but must always be stubbornly psychological. A lesson that never seemed truer than when M and I made up at nightfall in the shadow of a beachside barbecue whose luxury had become a humbling irrelevance. I love this part in this story. Obviously, he alludes to not being able to enjoy the beautiful beach and the hotel and everything else, the food, because of an argument that happened. So in my last video, I mentioned how we cannot escape the bad parts of our lives simply by getting on a plane and planting our bodies on some foreign land across oceans. I can promise you <laughs> that whatever mental burdens you have going on will not disappear by adding distance between you and the problems. Trust me, I've tried. I also love how he mentions the philosophers and their findings and how we should remember them whenever we are tempted by the idea that aesthetically pleasing places will rid ourselves of negativity, anxiety, or whatever it is that is upsetting us. I'm going to highlight this again. The state of the skies and the appearance of our dwellings can never on their own either undermine our joy or condemn us to misery. This is something that we should definitely keep in mind and which I think really speaks to sometimes a lot of people that you meet overseas, you know, oh, can't wait to escape. And I know we all say it. I mean, I say it sometimes too, you know, I feel like, oh, I just need to get out of here. But it's helpful to be aware of the fact that you really don't get out of your problems until you tackle them, fix them or address them properly. You can't just run away, usually. <laughs> or ever, really. So I promised this would be about solo travel, which is what I'm going to get to right now. Hear this next passage from The Art of Travel again, and this is what I wanted to highlight. It seemed an advantage to be traveling alone. Our responses to the world are crucially molded by the company we keep, for we temper our curiosity to fit in with the expectations of others. They may have particular visions of who we are, and hence may subtly prevent certain sides of us from emerging. I hadn't thought of you as someone who was interested in flyovers, they may intimidatingly suggest. Being closely observed by a companion can also inhibit our observation of others then too. We may become caught up in adjusting ourselves to the companion's questions and remarks or feel the need to make ourselves seem more normal than is good for our curiosity. 
But alone in Hammersmith in the middle of a March afternoon, I had no such concerns. I had the freedom to act a little weirdly. I sketched the window of a hardware shop and word painted the flyover. Again, I really like this passage too. I think it's really lovely. And after reading that and after thinking about my own experiences again, if I had to pinpoint the most beneficial aspect of solo travel, this is it. The freedom of acting and being completely and utterly weird if you want to, <laughs> being however you want to be in that moment without second guessing yourself. And maybe you're gonna argue with me. You'll say, D, I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I always do what I feel like. And maybe you think that, but I guarantee you, if you tested this theory, you'd be agreeing with de Botton as well to some extent. I mean, yes, there are some travel buddies that I've had that or that I've met over my travels and I can say, yeah, I felt really free with them, but I can still notice a difference to how I react to things compared to if I were to be alone. The most freeing thing about traveling alone is being able to do, act, react in the moment as naturally as possible. And of course, that you don't have to second guess any restaurant or hotel you stay at, you just do. That's an added bonus, of course. The last thing that I wanna highlight goes back to the book Full Tilt by Dervla Murphy, which I talked about a little bit earlier in this series of book talks. Here, Dervla describes her interaction with another young traveler who she's met. Here, she's taking you back to Kabul, which I will read in a moment. Today, I met a 25-year-old American boy in the museum who was typical of a certain category of youngster, European, Commonwealth, and American. I've met all along the road. To them, travel is more a going away from rather than going towards, and they seem empty and unhappy and bewildered and pathetically anxious for companionship, yet are afraid to commit themselves to any ideal or cause or other individual. I find something both terrifying and touching in young people without an aim, however foolish or wrong it may be. This young man was pleasant and intelligent, but wasting himself and resentfully conscious of the fact. He doesn't want to return home in the foreseeable future, yet after two years of it, is weary of traveling because he always holds himself aloof from the people he travels among, not through hostility or superiority, but through a strange and consciousness of unity of mankind. Is this something else our age does? On the one hand, make communication easier than before, while on the other hand, widening the gulf between those who are developed and those who are not. Um, remember again how I mentioned that we can't fly away from our problems. I think this also relates back to her interaction with this young man. Dervla seems to put it a little bit more eloquently than I probably would, but going away is what I feel like a lot of people might do, which she says is terrifying, I just think it's, you know, maybe a less mature way of doing things. Now, I wouldn't say that you need to have some sort of righteous aim or goal to accomplish each time you travel, but what I do think is appropriate is that we are traveling with appropriate positive attitudes rather than one based on an escape from our other lives. I've met countless people, like Dervla says, who say, I'll go home once the money runs out, but I'll leave first chance I get again which is interesting to me. The focus here is not on the experiences and the new people and places to explore. The focus is always more on going away and escaping. Not saying everyone is like this, but what I'm saying is that they definitely exist. My issue is that with this attitude, I don't think we are really apt to properly appreciate and absorb the places we come across. In that sense, if we have this attitude, we're kind of just passing through and passing time, which if that's what you want to do, I guess that's that's all good and dandy. But what I would rather challenge uh, ourselves to do is next time we go away, take a minute to revisit whatever problems might be going on internally in our own lives. And then are they egging us on to leave? Is that the reason that we're thinking about going away? So I encourage everyone, myself included, to try, sort out everything, then tackle your traveling goals. I promise you, you'll find your travel experience so much more pleasant this way. Anyways, guys, that is it for today. That is the end on my little series of travel thoughts, finishing off with a little bit about solo travel and escapes. And I hope you found it interesting. If you have anything you want to add to this, please leave me a comment. I would love to discuss this a little bit further, but if you like this video, like the video. And if you would like to watch more videos on some travel thought related topics, check out my channel. I have some more videos and also stay tuned because I will be continually coming out with more stuff like this. Thanks again for watching everyone. And I hope you have an awesome week. See you next time. Mm -hmm.